Good evening. Uh, I'm Joseph Estes. I'm a member of the Platypus Affiliate Society, um, and we're here uh, to see a panel on. And we're here tonight to uh, hear this uh, discussion on third parties and the left. Um, the Platypus Affiliated Society was established in December 2006. Uh, it organizes reading groups, public fora, does research and journalism focused on the problem and tasks inherited from the old, which is to say 1920s and 1930s, new 1960s and 1970s, and post-political 1980s to 1990s left. Um, and to the, uh, it does so to the end of uh, exploring the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Um, now, uh, this is a panel that we originally hosted a couple years ago, uh, actually the last election, I believe. Um, and uh, there is a description which has stayed the same, um, but we have added a number of questions um, to that uh, um, in order to allow us uh, to focus more on the nature of this uh, very peculiar um, election that we're countering this year. Um, I'm going to read those questions, but after uh, I introduce and allow the speakers to uh, give their opening statements. Um, to uh, my immediate left, we have William Peltz, who's director of the Institute for Working Class History. And next to him, uh, Mimi Solchik, uh, Socialist Party USA. Uh, he's running for president this year, so there's an option to vote for him. Uh, and further uh, to the extreme left over here uh, is Bill Park, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> is uh, uh, Lenny Brody, uh, who's with the Justice Party. Um, we're going to start with uh, each of them giving uh, eight minutes, uh, introductory remarks, and then um, following that there'll be two to four minutes for them to respond to each other, uh, and then we'll open up to Q&A after that. Um, so you want to go ahead and take it? Well, hello. Okay, so it's working. I just want to make a few general remarks about the problems that third parties, particularly third parties from the left, face in the United States political system. I think you can put them in sort of two general categories. First of all, structural problems, the way the political system is set up, and secondly, the way those structural problems have impacted upon the consciousness of the American public. So among structural problems, you have the fact that third parties have to always campaign in a media-saturated environment where they have little or no influence over the media. I think this is a, a key problem. Look, if you go all the way back to the old, old left of the Socialist Party and Eugene Debs, you find out that you know, one of the ways they were able to maintain a presence and build support was the fact that they did have some sort of media of their own, mass circulation papers that sold to workers and, and so on. So that's a, a really important structural problem, is that the, the media will either ignore you or turn you into a caricature, uh, any way they treat you, you can expect the media is not going to be advancing your cause, except if they happen to do it quite incidentally. Secondly, you have the problem of structure. One thing that they learned from Debs and the Socialist Party experience was to try to make it hard to get on the ballot, to try to make all these obstacles in the way of people actually achieving any sort of viable campaign. You see that most obviously by combining these two things, the media and the structures that are put forth after Debs, by de denying third parties a platform at the national debates. So we're not just talking about, well, we can't have 14, 15, 20 people in the debates, even though I'd say, well, why not have a series of debates, but even political parties that aren't Democrat and Republican who have achieved significant number of voters who may well receive hundreds of thousands if not a million votes are denied access to the debates. So you, you can see how all these structures combine in various ways to make it hard. Another structure is voter registration. The way that voter registration works tends to disenfranchise precisely those groups that you would think would be most receptive to a left-wing third-party message. And that makes it hard for them, so that's, that's sort of a problem. The other thing that I think is, is sort of structural is the fact that in the education system, people are taught that the United States is a two-party country, and that's what makes American democracy great. 
And this, of course, affects the consciousness when we talk about in a moment. That is to say, the idea that there are third parties, or fourth parties, or fifth parties, or sixth parties, whatever the case might be, in any election, is often totally news to people who went through the American education system. The idea that you can have more than the Democrats and Republican parties is something that is mystifying. After all, there's two sides to every question, and the point is they stress there's only two sides to the question, even if it turns out those two sides are absolutely identical on all the fundamentals. So that's the problem. All these structural barriers are thrown in the way of third parties. But what that has done, it has affected consciousness. If you look at studies after studies from the 1948 Wall selections, when um, Henry Walls was running as a progressive party candidate and polling was in its infancy, but you had polling. What happens is even people who are won over by a third party message get hammered over and over again, even if they've reached that point of breaking from the Democrats and Republicans, that their candidate is going to lose. And not only are they going to lose, by voting for that candidate, by supporting that candidate, they're actually contributing to the victory of somebody they hate even more the whole lesser evil problem. The other thing is the response of most people in many countries when they don't like the established parties is to look for an outsider party. I think, of course, of Paremos in, in, in Spain, for example, where the socialist party there is basically imploding, it's collapsing, they're having a split, it seems, uh, et cetera, et cetera, where people who are dissatisfied with the SPD in Germany could vote for Die Linke for all their problems and so on. But in the United States, the response is, if you don't like the two parties, don't bother to vote, right? Say you're too busy. Even though voting takes you a very small amount of time, the fact is people are really conditioned not to vote. And if you read the classic political science text on American government, they often say that this is a very healthy outcome for the system. That is to say that the sort of irrational and turbulent masses typically don't vote. And because they don't vote, you can have a system of safely competing elites. And these elites are all fundamentally committed to American capitalism, the American system as a structure, and therefore you always get one of those two. As Harry Truman once said, uh, obviously not a radical, hardly even a Democrat, but <laughs> he said, hit it on the head when he said, if you run a Republican against a Republican, a Republican will win every time. And in fact, the way the two-party structured is, uh, system is structured, it means that you have two bourgeois candidates that in a normal European country both be considered right-wing parties, and they run against each other. So no matter who wins, you get a right-wing party winning. So I think that a third party has a lot of obstacles. One final comment is I think sometimes we're tempted to leap over the hard work of building a movement connecting the party with social struggles, with worker struggles, and so on, and building it sort of from the top down. And I think that one of the lessons you can get from previous successes and failures of third parties is you really need to start at the grassroots and try to get what seems to the masses uh, achievable goals, like winning a city council seat. That might seem achievable. If you say that, well, I'm going to, Bill Pels is going to run for president on the Workers' Party ticket or something, uh, everybody would think, well, you've got no chance, right? Even if I've got a million people saying they're going to vote for in the polls, the newspapers would say I have no chance, they wouldn't mention me at all. But city council, there you could still have some impact. So I think that not just presidential elections, but really should be thinking about smaller down elections as well. So I'm not saying it's an impossible task by any means, but I think it's a lot more difficult than sometimes people realize. It's not just a matter of getting your platform out there and putting up a nice website, et cetera, et cetera. You have to be prepared for a long march, if you will, for a long struggle to gain the sort of uh, progress and develop the relationships with actual social movements, with actual people on the ground. And I think that's the sort of hard work that sometimes people get too discouraged and then they, they float off into the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or for leftists, often just not caring about elections at all. Um, as Joseph mentioned, my name is Mimi Saltisic. I am the Socialist Party USA's presidential candidate, and along with Angela Nicole Walker from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we make up the party's ticket. Um, my first thought about a, a, a panel like this 
um, is answering the question, uh, why run um, when you know so much of the country looks at victory um, in terms of electoral success? So, you know, about a year ago, um, when Angela and I considered this prospect of running, we wondered what it might look if we took um, the structure of an electoral campaign and essentially flipped it on its head. Um, yeah, I think so many folks, the focus is on the candidates, uh, and we who don't see socialism as something that you can implement from the top down, it's something that has to be built from the community level and work its way up. Angela and I wondered about how we might build a campaign that contributed to that effort. Um, you know, we acknowledge that on the day-to-day, -day, uh, as being part of a radical organization, that mainstream media is certainly not knocking down our door to find out what we're up to. Um, but that changes a little bit during a general election, and we anticipated with the inclusion of Bernie Sanders into this election that uh, those media opportunities might um, uh, increase a bit. So we had planned uh, to take advantage of those media opportunities to put forth um, an explicitly radical slash revolutionary message. Um, and our hope was that as we took advantage of those media opportunities, and really made an effort to deliver a message that was warm, that was inclusive, that was just loaded with humanity. Um, a sense of humor, um, and attention to uh, art and culture, that there may be folks who respond, folks who generally see the general election as a loss, any way that you slice it. And to do so, Angela and I and the rest of the folks involved with the campaign, we knew up front that we'd have to make a commitment uh, to make ourselves as accessible as possible to the people as we possibly could. It meant that, you know, we acknowledge that so many folks are tied into social media, that there are new ways of organizing that really buck convention and the way that le the left usually looks at organizing, that sort of thing. So we had to make ourselves readily available almost 24-7 to the folks that might respond. Um, and taking this approach and doing so in a way, like I said, uh, that's very warm and inclusive, the media has come, and to some extent, uh, to a degree that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, media outlets like Vice Magazine have done features on the campaign, um, Univision, Wired, we just did an interview with Cracked, which is a comedy uh, um, magazine, the LA Times, on and on and on, and they just keep piling on, and what we're finding you know, of course we ask, why are you interested? Because convention would tell us, as Bill had said, well, the media doesn't pay attention to us. Why are you paying attention? And a lot of this boils down to listening and to building and establishing relationships with people who generally feel completely disenfranchised from the electoral process. Um, we thought that there was a good chance that the folks who would responded to this message might respond with fear. Uh, these are folks who have never been involved with radical politics before. Uh, of course, there's some Cold War hangover. Um, so they might respond with fear. So we had to be prepared to address those fears, to do what we could do to help calm those fears. How do we do that? Uh, we use our spaces, our social media spaces, our uh, traditional media spaces, as opposed to Angela and I, the candidates, being there as essentially sage on the stage uh, uh, kind of presenters. We've allowed community organizers and folks who are involved with movement work to take center stage and to tell their stories about what this looks like, what this feels like, what the hopes are, what the dreams are, what the failures are. And in doing so, uh, our hope was that folks might be able to see some of this in themselves. And this might help them take that step forward into getting involved within their communities. Secondly, we thought that there might be people who would respond uh, who they're interested, but they don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn uh, to get involved within their communities. So using our network of organizers, activists throughout the country, whether they be socialist party or not, um, we help folks take that next step forward and help facilitate a relationship with folks in their communities. And we see them through that process. Um, and finally, um, we do all this in a way that, you know, the left, of course, is so rife with sectarianism. Uh, we've done it in a way that's, like I said, very warm and inclusive and inviting. And as a result, um, a lot of our support has come from folks, not only within the SP, 
but from organizations throughout the U.S. left. And a lot of the feedback that we've gotten so far has been along the lines of, this is what we've been waiting to see. Um, there was a message we got from the Hampton Institute, from Colin Jenkins, who's a writer from the Hampton Institute, uh, that said, this might be a glimpse of how we might do something like this in the future. You know, So we're using the presidential campaign as a mechanism to help facilitate the building of relationships at the community level. We're also telling folks, this just popped up a few weeks ago at the University of Michigan an event, don't look to us, Angelo and I, you know, for the answers. Um, I, me personally, I have no interest in a candidate who's, you know, going into uh, our oppressed communities, telling them, I have the answer for you. You know, individuals X, Y, Z, the oligarchs, etc. they've screwed you. Vote for me because I'm going to be the answer. I think people know that, you know, at this point, uh, that's a bunch of bullshit, right? Um, we're saying, don't look to us, look to one another. If we can help make a contribution to helping you build that relationship locally, we're here, you know? And as has often been said throughout this campaign for us, it's not election day which is of vital importance to us, it's what happens before and after election day. And, you know, we have every interest in seeing this process, the way this has developed, extending beyond election day. We use social media actively. We use technologies actively. We have video town halls every other week. Folks participate throughout the country. And as opposed to participating in an event where Angela and I are telling them our position on the ideas, when folks participate, they share their ideas, they connect with other folks throughout the country, and then those relationships, they uh, engage in a preparation for strategic planning to ultimately attack the capitalist system and to be prepared to replace uh, those pressure points within the capitalist system with alternatives. And you know, we have, like I said, every interest in seeing that process expand. So we do understand that this is a very different way for a lot of folks to look at uh, an electoral campaign, particularly at this level, but we have made a commitment from the beginning to be there for that process and uh, to help build those relationships. And I wanted to say, uh, to close, how grateful I am to be here and uh, to share the space with you all. Um, it's always tremendous. Uh, I think in the left we get so used to having our asses whipped uh, that sometimes we forget to uh, acknowledge what a victory might look like. And I think when you have a room full of folks that are interested in radical ideas and radical organizing and that sort of thing, to me that's a victory. That's meaningful. So I'm just very grateful to be able to sit here and to share this space with you all. So thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Lenny Brody. Uh, I've been a National Steering Committee member of the Justice Party since it was founded in 2011. However, I'm not speaking for the Justice Party, and uh, I don't think there will be many Justice Party members who have similar views that I'm going to express, so I just want to make that clear. <clears throat> uh, I, I really don't look at third parties as something that's a good idea or politically important. I think it's important for revolutionaries to look at what are the economic and political conditions that are forcing a political realignment. Because if, that, if that's not happening, then what you believe is not that relevant. Um, so uh, um, it, it seems to me that the 2008 economic crisis um, and the resulting economic insecurity that it's produced uh, has been pushing people uh, into political activity. So uh, <clears throat> I, I think I, I think it's important to look in, into his, the historical situation and try and find comparable examples. And uh, I don't think it's useful to look at the ups and downs of the business cycle and small parties that have been formed uh, by sections of the population that are dissatisfied because of the economic conditions. I think we have to look at serious structural crises and what those led to in terms of political realignment. And it seems to me in the history of the United States, the, uh, the best example is the pre-Civil War period that uh, 
Uh, what went on uh, in the pre-Civil War period was the destruction of one of the main parties, the Whig Party, and the creation of a new third party, the Republican Party, which in a relatively short time took political power. And so, um, you know, these discussions that, oh, uh, third parties have never been successful, you know, and the obstacles uh, that there are to, to electoral politics, I think don't recognize uh, the economic and political conditions which lead to political realignment. Uh, and I, I don't want to go into the history before the Civil War, but it's important to note that, you know, a rising industrial sector of the ruling class um, was forced into uh, the situation where they had to defeat the slave power. And so these, uh, these developments not only led to political realignment and change, but led to war. Um, and so we have to think of what the conditions are today, and uh, are they comparable? I think the, the, the situation, uh, well also the situation in the pre-Civil War period was that the, uh, the established parties couldn't deal with the question of slavery, which the situation demanded um, be addressed. And the situation today is that there's a fundamental structural crisis of capitalism going on. Um, and it's destroying the old industrial society and the stable middle class that held that society together. <clears throat> and and th this is the situation not only in the United States but around the world, and you know, we can discuss the different examples in Europe and, and all over the world, but, uh, but both the Democratic and Republican parties are in crisis. I think that's undeniable. Um, <clears throat> And it's my view that um, as the economic conditions deteriorate, there are going to be new parties, both of the left and the right. And it's not something that's a hard task that we're going to have to build or something like that. The conditions are going to lead to those parties, just as the conditions before the Civil War led to new parties and led to uh, political realignment and war. Uh, so it becomes it becomes for us as revolutionaries, what are our tasks in, the, in these kinds of conditions? What should we be doing? Um, and uh, I think, number one, the, the task is always to educate the working class and to strengthen the organizations of the working class. Um, and now I, I'm, I'm going to say something that I guess will get some discussion. Um, I think it's naive to think that the left can play a leading role in the formation of a progressive third party. Um, the, the reality is that numerically and organizationally, the left is, is even a shell of what it was in the 60s and 70s, you know, uh, let alone what it was in the 30s. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I, 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 well, from my point of view, I think the left is politically disoriented. So given these conditions today, to think that the left can lead some kind of formation of a progressive party, I think is, I don't know, living in a parallel universe or something. Um, <clears throat> and so what, is it, what does this mean? Who's gonna, who's gonna organize these new parties to deal with the situation? And I think we gotta be honest, uh, quite frankly, if there's gonna be a progressive party on the left, uh, it'll probably be organized by George Soros and his friends. Um, and uh, I, I think that, um, well, since I got two minutes, I better go fast. Uh, I think what we need to do uh, today, there is a lot of political activity at the ward level. And that um, uh, we need to root ourselves in the working class organizations, especially the community organizations. Because if we don't do this, and we try to participate in a, a progressive party that the left that the ruling class develops, we're just going to be playthings for the ruling class, and we'll have no strength at all. So the real focus is to root ourselves, to educate, and to organize the working class. <clears throat> um, I think that uh, 
we, we also need to have a perspective that whatever kind of party we're, we're looking to build, it can't be just an electoral party. It has to be a party that's rooted in the organizations of the working class. And, it, and if it's not that, if it's just a collection of individuals who either believe in socialism or are, you know, believe in good progressive ideas, that's not going to go anywhere. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I was asked to talk about the Justice Party, so I better say a few words. Um, the Justice Party was formed in 2011. Rocky Anderson, who was a two-time mayor of Salt Lake City, renounced his membership in the Democratic Party, <laughs> cursed him out and decided he was going to run for president in 2012. Um, a lot of us around the country who were hoping that we could split off the progressive sector of the Democratic Party and form a progressive third party work for his campaign. It obviously proved premature, and uh, I don't believe there were all that many lessons we learned from that, but I think that uh, you know that's, that was the history of the Justice Party. It's now kind of dormant. We'll see after the elections. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of activity and discussion. We'll see what happens. Um, and uh, I guess since I have 30 seconds, I'll, I will give some more comments in the question and answer period. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to read those questions that I brought up earlier. Um, maybe it'll help with the responses. Um, first question was, how does the present election represent an opportunity for the development of a third party? In what ways have Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, Jill Stein, and Gary Johnson each helped develop a window of opportunity for a third party? In what ways might these figures be responsible for miseducating, depoliticizing, or simply misdirecting political, uh, potential allies? Second. What conditions would create uh, would a Clint or Trump administration produce for the left? How would each represent the challenge to the left? Third, how might a third party avoid simply becoming either an instrument for pressuring the Democratic Party to the left or a mere recruiting tool for activist and sectarian organizations? In other words, what are the practical and theoretical obstacles to the development of the left beyond the default form of activity that have characterized it since the mid-20th century? Third, while we take for granted that a third party would have to distinguish itself from the two major parties, how could a third party attempt to draw from, voter, uh, from voters, draw voters from both the Democrats and the Republicans? And finally, the rise of progressivism and socialism in the late 19th and early 20th century defined every attempt at the development of a third party in the 20th century. How are the progressive and socialist how are progressive and socialist politics distinct and or related? What role would each play in the development of a mass third party? And yeah, if you guys could just take four or so minutes or so to respond to each other, it'd be great. Anybody want to go first? Or shall we go Bill? Bill? Same order? <laughs> I thought it should be reverse order. <laughs> <laughs> God, those are really difficult questions. Uh, well, first of all, you have a problem by a third party being a pressure group on the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also have a problem with the third party being a pressure group to try to push the Republican Party mm -hmm. left. Uh, you got to remember, Dewey in 1948 ran to the left of Truman on a whole bunch of things. So, I mean, again, you can't think it's necessarily fixed like that. And that's a that's a that's a real legitimate problem. And I think going back to what both the other speakers said, the way around that would be if you're actually rooted in real struggles and actually have things that you're promoting above and beyond wait for four years and vote for us again. In other words, it has to be an activist party that is constantly being involved in things. It's not just something there for you to vote for on election day uh, once every two or four years. So that's, that's important, but I think it's very important too to try to uh, explain to the people voting for you that what you're trying to do is not just to become like the Democrats or the Republicans, and not just to pressure the Democrats or Republicans, but you're actually trying to do something different, which is what I heard you saying from the Socialist Party in terms of trying to project something different. 
Um, so I think that's that's something that's uh, really important. In terms of a Clint, uh, Clinton-Trump administration, I don't think they're going to have a fusion ticket yet, but, oh, you meant they're separate administrations. <laughs> oh, well, well uh, I, mean, I think the answer is pretty much the same, right? Uh, in the sense that if Trump gets in, everybody will say, oh, fascism's around the corner. I'm old enough to remember when Nixon was elected, oh, fascism's around the corner. Uh, and if Clinton goes in, everybody will say, oh, we, we prevented fascism. Uh, then, you know, no, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I think to some extent, you can't ignore the realities of a Clinton or a Trump administration, certainly, but you can't sort of measure what you're going to do or what the big parties are doing. I mean, I think that's a mistake, and a, really a mistake you do, is to just concentrate on what they're doing and just respond to them. Then you become just reactive instead of proactive. And I think that's important, that you have a vision, you want to build something, you want to root yourself in communities and so on, and you have to proceed with that rather than just responding as a cheerleader or a booer to what the particular right-wing bourgeois party is doing at the moment, right? Uh, because that's too often what happens. It's like, oh, we're with Hillary when she does this, but we really didn't want her to send Marines to Syria. Gee, what a surprise, right? You know, so, I mean, you've got to get beyond it. So Trump's a pig. Okay, everybody knows Trump's a pig. Clinton's a pig. Uh, they're both pigs, right? Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have the nomination, right? So, you know, you kind of get beyond that because the biggest vote you want to win over, and here's why I might disagree with some people, is not people who vote Democrat and Republican, it's the people who don't vote. Right? The people who think politics is so crooked and so rigged and so not affecting their life or there's nothing they can do about it that they stay home. So that's the people you, you want to get, not the hardcore Clintonistas or you know the Trump brown shirts. Forget about those people. Uh, they're either come towards the third party or they won't. As Lenny said, if there's a crisis, who knows where even a lot of the Trump voters might wind up in terms of you know changing their views. But you have to not orient yourself towards them because then it's very easy to get sucked into only being a pressure group or a booing section for the two major parties. So, um, you know, as I mentioned in uh, my opening statement, uh, for Angela and I, uh, and so many of the folks that work with us in the campaign, our, our work is as uh, community organizers. Uh, Angela does work with Black Lives Matter in Milwaukee. Uh, I work with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, so many of our peers and uh, our comrades, they do similar sorts of work throughout their communities. Uh, and I think for the folks that we meet on a daily basis, who uh, are taking a moment to look at us because we're candidates, um, you know, our message is to them, as I mentioned at the beginning, is, you know, we're not here to give you the answer. We're not here to educate you. We're not here to lead you. We're here to work with you, you know? Um, and accessing, utilizing that network of community organizers and activists, uh, you know, the goal is to help plug those people into the movement work that's being doing, done throughout the country. You know, we're, we're revolutionaries, we're radicals, you know. Our interest is in overthrowing the capitalist system. Uh, we have no interest in reforms that kick the can down the road. Um, and, you know, for so many of the folks that, folks that we run into, when they think of the general election, uh, what they see and what they hear and feel is pain, you know. Uh, this has meant pain for me and my families. Um, and if we deliver that message, as I mentioned, in a very sort of uh, uh, friendly, warm, inclusive way, we find that folks do want to take the next step forward to get involved in their communities. And folks are starting to understand that it's the system that's the problem. And we're not talking about folks that are already involved in leftist work, you know? We have no interest in preaching to the choir. Like I said, we have no interest in the sage on the stage kind of presentation, you know? Our interest is just making a contribution to doing whatever we can do to help swiften the revolutionary pace in the U.S. We don't say we have all the answers, you know? Um, and as a matter of fact, when we do host in-person events, we just had six this past week in the Midwest. Uh, the way we set those up, the events up, our folks in the community come and they share answers with one another. They share ideas and they all leave those events with new contacts in their communities to help work to address their problems, you know? If Angela and I can be there to help remind the folks that they have the power to address these issues, that's wonderful. And, and that's why we're here. Um, so for me personally, and I think for Angela as well, 
oftentimes the discussion about the election, it almost feels like we're over here. You know, we're having a different kind of discussion. Um, and if it wasn't going to be that way, she and I wouldn't be the candidates to do this. Um, so that's what I got. Uh, first, I'd like to answer a question that, that has come up in, in some of the discussions I've had with some of my friends in Platypus. Uh, because I'm always arguing for the importance of building a very broad-based, open, flexible, mass, working-class party. And, um, uh, and then the response I usually get is, well, what about building a socialist party? And I think it's critical for revolutionaries to understand that we need both the, to uh, facilitate the, the growth of mass, broad, open, working-class organizations, and organizations of revolutionaries, that we need both. That if revolutionaries can have um, uh, you know, meetings and discussions where they discuss longer term strategy, where they collectively evaluate and educate themselves, um, then uh, we get lost. But there's no reason to block working class people from coming into a mass party by demanding that they're not, that they have to be socialists. I think that party has to be pro-socialist in general. You can't, it can't be against the concept of socialism. And I think Bernie put up a good example. He was a socialist, but he didn't demand everybody who voted for him or supported him had to be a socialist. And so I, I think that the, the key importance of broadening out the organizations of the working class as, as much as possible is important but also, without organizations of revolutionaries, um, nothing will happen. And uh, I, I, I'm convinced of that. The other question is the, the question of, of fascism. Um, I don't believe individuals bring about fascism. I think that, uh, you know, under certain circumstances, the capitalist ruling class needs fascism to control um, the country, and it moves in that direction. Um, and it also um, uh, facilitates candidates who help build that. You know, I know people think that Trump is help, helping to build a base of fascism, um, but I don't, I don't think that's the key question. The key question is understanding the dynamics of the economic and political situation and whether the ruling class needs fascism and what, um, what revolutionaries need to do in, the, in those conditions. So I don't think it's a valid excuse to vote for Hillary to oppose fascism. Um, I think it's the ruling class. And actually, in a lot of ways, Hillary is a, a much more capable of instituting whatever is necessary than Trump. Um, so uh, um, I also think that the, the conditions we're facing after the elections are going to be very interesting and important for discussions to take place. What are we going to build after the election? Because it's clear that Bernie's organization, Our Revolution, is bullshit. You know, it's uh, it's clear that Democracy for America, Progressive Democrats of America, uh, Move On, all of these organizations, and in Chicago here, the Reclaim Chicago and People's Lobby are all trying to keep us in the Democratic Party. And so the question becomes, you know. What, what role can we play as revolutionaries? Where are we at? And I, I, I'd like to say again that there's a lot of very interesting activity going on in the working class in Chicago at the ward level. There are organizations, every parks department has an organization for a park with an advisory board. There are neighborhood associations. These are the real, associ uh, the real organizations of the working class that revolutionaries have to be part of. And if we really want to have any kind of influence in this society, that's where we have to root ourselves. And we've got to stop talking to each other. You know, we've got to talk to the working class. And uh, I didn't mean stop talking to each other. We have to meet and discuss uh, our strategic and educational uh, activity. But we, we really have to, our main activity has to be within the working class. And if that's not happening, um, then the group is, or the individuals are really not that relevant. All right, so let's uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, I saw Gregor first. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a 
question for Bill and then one for Bibi. Um, Bill, can you say why the Socialist Party of America under Eugene Debs had such potential mass appeal in ways that the left doesn't have anymore? You said they had media of their own, but can you like, say why you know, someone would either want to vote for them or not just vote for them, but get involved, talk to other workers, and get them involved and become part of the Socialist Party? Can you say something about what was there that isn't there today? And for Mimi, you said your activities are directed primarily to oppressed communities. Do you see some role of white workers, potentially also white workers who might be racist, um, as part of the Socialist Party? Okay, I think the, the victory of Debs uh, in terms of like winning over a lot of people had to do with being connected with organically the rising working class movement in the United States. He himself was a famous union leader, the railroad worker strike, and being imprisoned after Pullman and things like that. So you actually had a situation where he was riding the objective conditions in favor of that that came out of the Gilded Age. But also going back to the organizational thing, what people forget is that the Socialist Party in 1912, okay, Debs may have gotten 6% of the vote, but they also, in 1912, elected something like 12, 1,500, I forget, different local office holders. In other words, a lot of times Debs came into an area uh, having no illusions he was going to win the state or become president, but he was there because he was a name, he was famous, he was a great speaker, and there'd be some mediocrity like me running for city council, and I'd get to sit on the platform with him, and he'd try to whip up the workers to go out and vote socialist and get me elected, and maybe some of the workers would go out and vote for you know, Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> or whatever, but they'd also vote for me because you know, they liked Debs. To uh, answer your question, um, no, I, I don't see a role for racist white workers in the Socialist Party. Just clarify, because the SPU uh, in America under Debs did have racist Correct. members. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, no. Um, now, is there an effort to attack the, you know, systems of oppression? Of course. Uh, um, one of the things I wanted to say, too, just really quick, that uh, to piggyback off your first question, I think what we're finding now um, is, uh, particularly with young folks, uh, with regards to the media, is that uh, through the use of social media and technology, the folks are finding new ways uh, to use outreach, uh, to share ideas, to share organizing strategies, that sort of thing. Um, so the role that the mainstream media has to play, while it's certainly significant, what we're finding, and there are folks I know here in this room who do a tremendous job of uh, using uh, social media, um, to message, to outreach, to resonate with folks, and to resonate with communities that um, may have, uh, you know, may not be looking toward mainstream media for, uh, you know, their news or, or a contribution to their analysis of the electoral process. Um, so I, I'm actually very optimistic um, when I, I see that when you actually uh, make an effort to build relationships and to listen to folks throughout the country and see what it is that they're doing to share their stories, uh, that uh, the message you get is pretty inspiring, you know? Um, and, and like I said, there are folks here in this room who are doing it, and um, I'm really hopeful. Uh, I just want to comment on the second, on the second question about white workers. Um, I think it's becoming clear that um, if the revolutionaries are not based amongst, uh, in addition to other sectors of the working class, amongst the white workers, that that guarantees fascism will win in the United States. And um, this, uh, this lack of understanding of a class analysis in the United States and just seeing social oppression uh, almost in some instances in opposition to, to the class question is a serious problem. Um, and uh, I think Bernie was very good at this. I mean, the, the white working class vote has been split between Trump and Bernie. And, uh, and without, without Bernie, uh, you know, so many, I, I've heard so many anecdotal uh, discussions about white workers who were supporting Bernie, but now they're going to vote for Trump. You know? And it's, uh, it's quite critical for revolutionaries to have this understanding. Um, you know, and, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm a, I'm a white worker, I'm not a professional, I was a typesetter when I was working, and um, 
you know, and, and my family and my friends um, are not these evil people, you know, a lot of, and a lot of times racism is skin deep, you know, I mean, they don't, you just say it because that's what you heard, you know, and uh, uh, I think it's important, see, it's real important for us to, to study what society is really made up of, what the, our, the United States history is, and uh, if we're going to begin to organize a real revolutionary struggle. Hello? Okay, great. Um, so, I want to pose to you the sort of quandary that's been on my mind listening to your remarks, uh, you know, particularly about the conditions for political realignment. Uh, when we look at the rise of the Socialist Party back in the teens and 20s and 30s, uh, you have the labor movement, and that's growing, and that poses a serious threat to the continuation of capital. It's able to shut down production. You see a very big contrast historically in our current climate. We don't really have a labor movement that's able to exercise the same kind of economic power. Um, what do you see the challenges for a third party in terms of actually progressing towards some kind of socialist politics in the absence of uh, a labor uh, movement? Um, and, and how do you see, you know, sort of the gradualist approach that all three of you have sort of articulated in terms of, you know, the east of the communities rising, you know, to a certain point where you're able to run for first ward, then state, then president. I, I, how does that sort of compute without a labor movement? Is it about building a labor movement organically, or, you know, is it about waiting for some kind of turning point where you're able to, you know, jump on an opportunity and change comes very swiftly? So I guess it's sort of two points that I'd like you to uh, address. And the first is the labor movement, its connection to socialist politics, um, and then also, you know, the theory of socialist politics either being gradual or being very sudden and quick and being able to seize opportunities as they come forward and grow very decisively and quickly. How do you think that's going to play out? You know, I, I, I think it, it's so important to, to study Marxism and root ourselves in historical materialism rather than the ins and outs of politics and things like that. The reality is, if you study society, that past period, whether it was the Socialist Party or the Communists in the 30s, and the growth of the Union Movement was a thing of the past. The Union Movement was built on large-scale factories. Those factories are gone. The, the Union Movement is dying. Uh, it's merging, it's shrinking, and if you base yourself on the Union Movement, um, I, I don't think you're going to go anywhere. The last hurrah of the Union Movement was the Labor Party in the 90s, you know, and we can, you know, at another time discuss what happened to that. But right now, um, you can't equate the Labor Movement with trade unions. What I'm talking about, and I'm not talking about gradualism, I'm talking about rooting ourselves in the working class communities. And um, these are the communities that rioted in the 60s. These aren't conservative communities. These are the communities that are in the streets today. And also, I'm not talking about local elections first and then presidential elections. Bernie Sanders opened up the local elections. Now, I'm, uh, I'm in the 35th Ward and I worked on Carlos Rose's campaign and we, you know, that started before Bernie. But um, a lot of what's going on in the other wards is a result of what Bernie did and even in, in the 35th. You know, a lot of the people who are flowing into our ward organization are, is a result of, of Bernie's campaign. So I, I don't agree with, you know, local versus national. I think we need, we need both of them. But I think that we have to study society, and society has been transformed since the 1900s. It's no longer an industrial society. The lessons from the Debs uh, period, you know, there, there may be some lessons to learn, but we have to study what's going on today and where to base ourselves in today's working class movement, what it looks like, who it is, um, and uh, these are the discussions that have to take place, you know, based on today's reality, not, you know, what we thought happened in the past. So, 
while I see the importance of the we need to study, I, I think for so many folks there's the need to act because quite literally they can't breathe, right? Um, and as opposed to gradualist approaches, I can tell you that a lot of the community organizing, the folks that I see, that I'm involved with, um, the work that they're doing is focused on the here and now, in victory in the here and now. For example, I mentioned a bit ago that um, I work with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition in Los Angeles. Um, that's a coalition that works directly to challenge the Los Angeles Police Department's brutality, their surveillance, the oppression of the people. We know that the police department was gifted two drones by the Seattle Police Department. Uh, through our work, rather quickly, we've managed to keep those drones grounded. They currently sit in the Inspector General's office at the LAPD. We're working right now on a campaign that has a tangible, uh, that has a deadline to stop uh, uh, the use of the FBI's Preventing Violent Extremism in Schools program that targets children ages K through 12 um, for engaging in activities such as expressing uh, 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 an interest in their culture or expressing uh, rage and anger through art or spoken word. These are programs that target uh, our children and contribute to that school to prison pipeline. Our goal here with this campaign is to have that program, that FBI program, stopped by October. So, you know, we engage in these programs, we do our strategic planning, we set goals where we can see a victory, we expect to see victories, and um, I, I continue to see more and more and more of this sort of organizing throughout the country on a daily basis, and where we can count those victories, we can analyze the defeats that we've had, we can share information quickly. Uh, just last week, the founder of the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, a man named Hamid Khan, he's written for The Intercept, for The Guardian, etc., uh, heavily involved in the strategic planning of the, of the Stop LAPD Spying Spy Coalition just gave a video teaching to uh, the Socialist Party folks uh, through our Prison Industrial Complex Commission, sharing information about how we might stop through our communities this FBI preventing violent extremism uh, campaign. So, you know, the, the focus here is not on the gradualist approach, it is on the victory. In that particular coalition, the ultimate goal is the abolition of the police. We attend on a weekly basis the police commission meetings with uh, LAPD Chief Charlie Beck. Very explicit that we want them gone. We want community control over the police. And, the, and we won't stop until we get that, you know. And uh, we're looking for that all the time, the victory, you know. And we acknowledge the victory. We celebrate the victory. And we keep going on until we reach the goal that we're looking for. I just wanted to comment on the labor movement question. I disagree uh, that the labor movement is like dead or going to be dead. The current union structure may be dead, but I think just like you know, mass factory unions replace artisans and craftsmen, you now see there's mass production factories everywhere. It's called McDonald's. And the fight for 15 shows that there is potential to organize people who uh, fall outside the traditional purview of the union bureaucracy. Uh, look at Starbucks, look at Burger King, look at all these fast food places, look at all these service workers, these tech slaves, temp slaves, and so on. These people are all ripe for union organizing of one sort or another. So I think that connected with a radical movement and political parties, it's to support or push for more organizing among the unorganized, particularly the expanding sectors that represent 21st century American capitalism. Um, so, I have two questions. Um, the first one is primarily for Lenny. So, I had a question about um, what you said about Bernie and then also what you said about the People's Lobby. Because um, you brought up the People's Lobby and kind of how their activity in Chicago is about keeping us in the Democratic Party. Um, and then when you were talking about Bernie, you kind of talked about how he opened up these possibilities at the local level. So, um, obviously, he was running through the Democratic Party um, and my experience uh, as a U Chicago student, the People's Lobby, you know, was part of campaigning for Bernie. And so these things are kind of connected. Um, so how do you kind of reconcile, um, you know, identifying a problem with the People's Lobby trying to keep us in the Democratic Party, and then kind of um, the potentials that Bernie opened up, and if there's a difference between the two. And then my other question 
is about um, the transition from this kind of movement or community-based politics um, to a socialist party. Um, like it was, uh, you just said that you were focused right on like the victory, and so like the ultimate goal, for example, that you just said of your campaign was to abolish the police. Um, so then like, how does the ultimate goal become the socialist party, and how do these um, kind of community-based efforts, um, how do we know that they lead to the potential for the type of mass politics that could lead to the ultimate, ultimate goal of socialism? Um, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I guess the question whether Bernie should run as an independent or Democrat is a thing of the past, so I won't go into that. Um, but I, I think his campaign just mobilized so many people, and it was really irrespective of the Democratic Party. It, they, people were just fighting for what he stood for, and it was, uh, and it mobilized people into political action. Um, now I, you know, I went to the original People Summit, and I went to the People Summit meeting this past weekend, and the breakout session um, uh, on down ballot elections. The guy said like 30 times he was a Democrat, he was always going to be a Democrat, and blah, blah, blah. You know, their orientation, and so many groups, the orientation is to try and use the energy from Bernie's campaign to organize people to their own organizations, to build, which are all about uh, influencing within the Democratic Party, getting a seat at the table. Um, all of this kind of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, but my experience in the 35th Ward is that uh, Bernie's campaign brought people into the Ward organization, mobilized them, um, and uh, the fight we've had there, you know, to some degree is, is about uh, political independence, you know, and that's, that's where it's at right now. Um, so uh, I hope that, that answered the question. So um, that particular example I gave, that was um, the abolition of the police in Los Angeles. That was work with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, uh, of which the uh, Socialist Party's Los Angeles local uh, were a member. We work on their communications team and that sort of thing. However, that goal of uh, the abolition of police, um, it's also in alignment with the, the Socialist Party's goal, the abolition of police. Um, and I see the way that this works and the way that it has been working as this. Um, we have folks here like uh, Miguel and Fernando uh, who are doing anti-gentrification work, you know, here. Uh, or AJ back there who's doing work with the prison industrial complex. You know, they have a sphere of influence, you know, they have friends, family, neighbors, uh, fellow students, co-workers, that sort of thing. And as they proceed with those relationships, and they do so in a warm and inclusive way, uh, they deliver their message in a warm and inclusive way, that has an effect, you know, that has an impact. And frequently what Angela and I are finding throughout this campaign, often, almost on a daily basis, we say to ourselves, like, what is going on here? Because we're finding that more and more and more folks, and I'm not talking in ones and twos, but more and more folks who have never been involved or perhaps have never considered radical politics, that they're reaching out and saying, uh, this makes sense, and also saying, well, you all were here for me, you know, you listened to me. Um, and I felt like you cared about me, and the truth is, I hope we do care, you know, um, in a very genuine and sincere way. And I, I think through that care, through sharing spaces with folks, um, that it becomes much, much easier to see folks take a step forward and um, engage in work that they may have never considered, you know. And, and that's, that's really why we're here. strategy, I guess, of facilitating community activism. Um, it seems to me that the long-standing sort of issue with uh, this approach is that um, in the attempt to uh, address the immediate issues that are of most direct concern to people's lives, especially poor people's lives, um, the most effective 
avenue to do that clearly is to like elect progressive Democrats. And so even in the case of something like Black Lives Matter, um, you know, I forget what the official organization is called, but like the national organization that kind of coalesced out of that. I was reading their website and it's basically gonna be like a sort of lobbying group uh, for the Democrats to try and get their policies put into, into action. And so my question is, uh, by taking a back seat um, in, in, in not trying to lead uh, uh, the movement, um, how do you overcome the uh, gravitational pull of the Democratic Party um, and, and break with that uh, problem, which has really seemed to um, mire the left for 50 years? Um, so yeah, I'd be interested in hearing everybody's perspective on this. But. Do you want to start since uh, again? Okay. Well, certainly not my position to tell uh, you know Black Lives Matter what they should or shouldn't be doing. Um, now you know, and like I said, Angela does work with Black Lives Matter in Milwaukee, um, and I think that Angela, who is explicitly radical, revolutionary, and uh, who also, by the way, ran in 2014 for sheriff in Milwaukee County and uh, got almost 70,000 votes. Um, and I think that we see in Angela, I, I, I just said this a few days ago, to me, Angela is what revolution looks like, you know? Um, the way that she carries herself, you know? To meet Angela, you have somebody who is explicitly revolutionary, is radical, and she does this work with a smile on her face, even though there's a lot of pain there, you know? But she does this with a smile and with a hug, and, um, you see the inspiration that comes from that and the effect that that has on others, you know? Um, she inspires the hell out of me. And, and I've been able to participate in events uh, with these video town halls that I mentioned uh, in person in Milwaukee. And seeing the effect that someone like Angela has on her communities, you know, where the message is explicitly radical. It is, with regards to the Democrats or any capitalist party, get the hell out of my face. You know, you got nothing for me. Um, and to see that response, that reception, it, it, it's tremendous. So this leaves me feeling very hopeful, you know. Um, so that, that, that's what I got to say about it. I really do think that uh, it's so important, I think, for any one of us to really recognize the power that we have, you know, and to step into that power. Uh, with any of the community of work that we do, you know, us as radicals, revolutionaries, you know, um, as opposed to giving that power up to, you know, progressive, you know, elements, that sort of thing, step into that as radicals and revolutionaries. Um, and if we do so in that warm and inclusive way, uh, you know, the response, in my experience, has been really positive. I, I, th I think the key thing that you said was for the past 50 years, and the important thing is to understand what was happening 50 years ago and what's happening today. Um, in the 1950s, the McCarthy period smashed the left trade unions because they were able to give pay raises to the workers. You know, you, they, they're not going to take their, their organizations being smashed and, and gutted um, for, for just no reason. Um, and you have to understand that the past 50 years, capitalism was able to deliver. And it's only, not the past 50 years, but before the past 30 years, um, that uh, capitalism delivered the goods, you know, and people had halfway decent lives. The, the changes that are going on is destroying the middle class, which was the, the stable foundation of capitalism. And what's happening today is you can fight for those demands, but the Democrats expose themselves. They can't deliver. I mean, Bar Barack Obama had a majority at the beginning of his, his term. Uh, Pat Quinn had a majority. All of these guys are dogs, and they can't and they can't deliver because the economy doesn't allow it. And that's you know, in a, in a lot of ways, you know, I, I think it'll be a little easier if Hillary wins. We can expose the Democrats better. But it's the conditions that are gonna gonna move people away from the Democratic Party, and we should fight. You know, for everything we need and everything we deserve, you know, uh, um, and understand. But as revolutionaries, we understand we're going to get very little of that, and we have to 
talk about the need for the, the future transformation of society and the establishment of socialism and eventually communism because uh, that's the only thing that can solve the problems of today. Yeah, if I could comment on that briefly. Uh, I see a problem here that sort of mimics the whole problem you had with the Socialist International and Second International, and that is it would very easily fall into the trap they did of having a minimal program, uh, vote socialist cause in Milwaukee because it means lower taxes because uh, we're tax big business, uh, and a maximal program, someday we'll have communism in a classless society. And the problem with working in these community organizations can be that it can be very uh, important. I think it's vital and essential. But on the other hand, you can think that, you know, you can build socialism in Logan Square uh, yeah, or something like that because you had, had some sort of little victory. And uh, those are important. Every little victory, this meeting's a victory, as you said. But the fact is, you've got to have a consistent idea that this is going to be difficult to connect those little struggles who, I mean, who's not for the police stop shooting people? Well, you have to be pretty hard-hearted to say the police should, you should go around shooting innocent people. So, I mean, yeah, of course people agree with that, and you've got to fight for that even now. But still, how do you connect that to a larger struggle? And having a minimal and maximal program didn't work. Uh, Trotsky tried to come up with a transitional program, the idea of making demands that people would accept as reasonable, but capitalism couldn't accept. I mean, it's obviously horribly outdated. But, you know, you have to think about a strategy beyond just winning local struggles. Or otherwise, all you wind up with is sort of a, a pink-flavored Saul Alinsky community organization model. Should we collect the roll questions? Maybe two, three. Um, I see two of these at least. We have some time. Um, but I, I'm... Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to follow up on the idea about the role of unions and third parties and the union movement. Lenny seems to be saying they're becoming irrelevant. Uh, I think I got that right. And we seem to think, uh, Bill, that there's still a lot of future for uh, the growing, uh, what could be a growing union movement um, in having a big role in third parties. Uh, I think everybody would agree today one of the big obstacles to an independent left political party is the union leadership. I mean, they seem adamantly opposed to it. Not only that, but I've seen where they they oppose even an independent, like a single independent who's running against a, a corporate Democrat, good union person, and all the credentials. They won't, they won't give them a dime, or her a dime, and, you know, they'll support some really bad. So, how do you see, whatever the union movement is going, how do you see, is it going to make a transition and become a supporter of third parties? It seems like even if they do grow, they're still going to be the same old, same old. And um, apparently you're, you may be seeing something different. Well, I like the other speakers, of course, comment on this as well. But I don't know whether I'm seeing anything different. It's just the way the lens you look at it. I mean, I think that there's a growing number of people who are attracted to some sort of workers' organization, which traditionally we call unions. I think you see that in the fight for 15 and all sorts of various workers' action. These people are ripe for organization. That doesn't necessarily mean they can be housebroken by, like, the old standard uh, union leadership that we have. That will, of course, be the attempt. For example, I'm in the American Federation of Teachers. I probably shouldn't say that in public, right? Uh, anyhow, uh, anyhow, and our president, in return for various promises made by the Clinton campaign, uh, just had our union uh, immediately support Clinton during the primaries without even asking any of the members. And I happen to know from so many people who are close to work in the headquarters there, that it's not even clear that the Clinton endorsement couldn't have carried a secret ballot at the AFT staff headquarters, let alone uh, among the membership. So the thing is, yes, they've got control of it, this rotten old sellout leadership, but especially if new forces flow into it, uh, new people get involved and form perhaps new unions, or maybe working class organizations that consider themselves more community groups in some ways. I mean, I'm not saying that you know unions per se are uh, sacrosanct or anything like that, but it could change. It could really change. And you can't just write off people looking at class 
and their problems that they have to work for a living as not being relevant because people will always have a certain vested interest unless they're independently wealthy, in which case they probably won't be interested in our projects anyhow. Um, they're, they're, they'd be interested in, well, can this organization do something for me? After all, you couldn't think of a sort of demographic that was considered worse for organizing than fast food workers. They're afraid, they wouldn't strike, they get fired, uh, they're, they're replaced all the time, they get paid nothing, they're lowly educated, they're temp workers, blah, blah, blah. Yet they've had huge demonstrations. And that people wouldn't have predicted uh, before the whole fight for 15 got underway. Now granted, it's being funded by, by the old trade union bureaucracy who's trying to keep a lid on it, but, but can they? Right? And I think part of our job would be to try to prevent them from keeping a lid on it and not just the fight for 15, but any of those sort of mass expressions of, you know, popular discontent with working conditions. So it's not just community issues, although they're very important. I mean, it's also, you know, what is it like to be a worker in this society? Just to piggyback off, you mentioned the fight for 15. <laughs> uh, you know, seeing union members as friends, uh, family, neighbors, you know, et cetera, uh, I think as, you know, as, as radicals, one thing that's been really wonderful uh, is being able to engage in the discussion about what does the fight for 15 mean? What does living wage look at like? You know, like I, where I live in Los Angeles, if you're a single parent with a child, uh, a living wage for you is just under $26 an hour, you know? Uh, so, you know, even at $15 an hour for every hour you work, you're sinking $10 an hour, you know? And I think as, uh, as, as a radical, uh, this is a really great moment uh, to be able to engage in a dialogue with folks as the Fight for 15 movement has developed. What does this mean, you know? And um, it, it's just been really eye-opening, and, and, and again, it's been really inspiring to see folks, this may be information that they're hearing for the first time, you know? The unions may have brought it to that point, the, fight, the, the $15 an hour point, uh, but to present to them and to be able to share information with them, you know, living wage data and that sort of thing, and to see for that, that realization of what does this mean? What's happening to me and my family, you know? What should I expect? What should I demand? And I think that's the role that we can all play now. I'm certainly not looking toward union bureaucracy, you know, to, to help provide solutions. Uh, but I am looking toward that dialogue and that relationship with our friends and family members who may also be union members, you know? To share that information, to have a discussion about that, and to talk about, how can we make that difference? How can we push past that fight for 15 and fight for that living wage, you know, that's going to put food on the table, cover the bare necessities for their families, you know? So uh, we look at this in a very revolutionary, radical way. Uh, we see the unions bringing the folks up to that point, and we're here to push that point further. <coughs> I just want to say that I, I think it's important not to look at workplace organizing as the only expression of class uh, organizing and that uh, very often um, you can find much more working class organizations in the communities. Um, and uh, it's, it's a whole other discussion, but I think a, a major mistake of the left historically has been to equate working class organizing with unions. My name is Zachary, I appreciate the input tonight. This question is directed more specifically toward Mr. Pels. Um, I understand the, and appreciate the labor perspectives and the uh, party building perspectives, but from a political science perspective, there's the party enabling question, which is a question of um, if we don't have a proportional representation system, if we don't have right choice voting, then what incentives do voters have to even risk a third party jeopardizing the lesser evil? Uh, from Lenny. So essentially, do laws matter? And if so, uh, what is their, how do they matter? What is their role in limiting the third party? Well, I think laws, of course, make it very hard for third parties. That's why Pat Quinn, for example, rode his political career off abolishing the one semi-democratic feature in Illinois state government, and that was multiple member districts for the state assembly, where you, you had three votes when you went in and voted. You could vote, give one vote each to three different candidates, one and a half votes to two, or three votes to one, which allowed that, that sort of voting system allowed the possibility for real mavericks and real independents to get in. 
right? Uh, and he campaigned on a right-wing populist thing. We have too many politicians. They cost too much. Let's reduce the size of the House, uh, and so on. So, I mean, yes, they make a big difference. But on the other hand, you know, it's like they took that away. Something like that could, could come back again, too. So you could fight for changes in the laws in terms of the voting system. I mean, I think that's important. Now, in terms of the whole thing about throwing your vote away, I think that would be true if we had 95% of registered voters, or better yet, eligible voters, going out there and voting Democrat and Republican. Then you'd have a, an argument. But from the way I look at it, when you go beyond registered voters particularly and go to potential voters and see how many people aren't voting, right? Those people don't feel like they're throwing their vote away by not voting. So why would they think they're throwing their vote away for voting for a third party? There's a, I just want to hear from the panel what your, your guys' definition of community organizations are. Um, and I ask that because throughout this conversation, um, I'm hearing, you know, get involved in community organizations and everything. But what does that mean to you? Because, let's be fair and honest, there are front groups that is paid by Democratic Party, SEIU, I can name his name if you want me to, but we also need to look at things, and I haven't heard from the panel yet about structures that are already in place. Zapatistas down in Mexico, the Pink Gang in India, what Zach and I did in Springfield with Occupy Springfield and everything. So those things already exist. How come we're not encouraging people to do those kind of structures? Because I look at that as community organizations in a very autonomous and interdependent way. Yeah, go ahead. What? If you want to answer that. Uh, you know, one thing I think of when I hear folks say, uh, we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to get involved in, um, you know, community organizing. That's an area where me personally as a community organizer and as a candidate who has you know, um, a forum that maybe I, 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 I have not done a great job because um, most of the, the peers, most of the folks that I work with are involved in community work, you know. Community work independent of uh, Democratic Party sponsored, you know, community work. Um, and to me, it, you know, it, it sort of highlights the need for this approach that we've been taking with the campaign and to see that expand, you know. Um, to share those spaces for community organizers, and like I said, some who are sitting here in this room, uh, to be able to share their stories so that more and more folks, and folks who are saying, we need to get involved, we need to get involved, um, to hear from those folks who are involved, you know, that, hey, there are opportunities here in your community, there are folks here. Yes, the work is hard, um, it can be demoralizing, it can be incredibly tough, um, but those opportunities are there. I mean, you know this, AJ. You know, uh, you're involved. So, you know, from my position, and just speaking from my experience alone, that just tells me that, you know, I, I can do a better job, perhaps, of sharing stories, using every opportunity that I have to help share stories of the people who are doing the community work. Because there's certainly the need. There's certainly wonderful organizations and, and community groups who are doing great work throughout the country. Um, that information needs to be shared as widely and as far as possible. Uh, I think you're raising the main point about community organizing. Um, you know, in, in my day, there was community organizing back in the day. Um, today, Barack Obama is a community organizer. <laughs> you know, today, um, uh, the only people who, uh, who were willing to be community, well, not the only, uh, a great number of people who were willing to be community organizers insist on getting uh, equivalent pay that they would get in the private sector. The non-for-profits in the communities are one of the main problems. You know, I, so I completely agree with you, and we have to be clear on, on you know, who are in our community is doing what. You know, there, there are community organizations that are not for profits that can't be political, and, uh, you know, and who are in fact tied to the Democratic Party and part of the problem. But increasingly, there are independent ward organizations developing that aren't paid, um, uh, 
Carlos Rosa, the alderman in 35th Ward, <coughs> pledged to give a minimum salary to his executive director of his ward organization from his pay, you know. Um, so there, there's the beginnings of changes, but in the past, it, it, it was a good job to be a community organizer, you know. And most of them didn't organize anything. They'd have one-year annual dinners where they turned out people because they gave them free food and free other things, and that was their expression of a mass organization. So I think, I, I, I think it's important to understand, you know, what's being organized. I also think it's important to understand um, that we're talking about organizing for political power, that we're not joking around, we're not you know, having ultra-democratic, anarchistic uh, organizations that working class people don't relate to. We're talking about you know, uh, discussing how we're gonna take over the country, you know, whether it's uh, in the community or anywhere else. And I think we have to um, you know, raise these questions and, and, uh, and question people who are being paid uh, you know, a fair amount of money to do very little. Uh, just one quick comment. I think the problem with the term community organizing is it's an expression that is used very indiscriminately. So you have these astroturf groups, as they're sometimes called, which are just fronts by corporations or, say, the Republican or Democratic parties, and they're not even vaguely community organizers, but they're portrayed in the media as community organizations. So when you look at community organizations, you should look at them the same way, same way you'd look at a political program. That is to say, are they really organizing for the people? Are they organizing to improve things in a way you want? Or are they just shills for some corporation? Are they just, you know, some Hillary fan club funded by Goldman Sachs? So I'm going to ask a couple questions here. Um, earlier, Bill, uh, you articulated a lack of concern with the direction of the two parties. Um, I was... And an, I recalled for a moment the, uh, the assertion Lenny made um, that the most radical thing that happened in U.S. politics that has ever happened in U.S. politics was the rise of the Republican Party that ended slavery um, and how that came out of a crisis in the two-party system, the Whig Party. Uh, additionally, the, way, the fact that the, the Socialist Party in the 19th century came out of a crisis in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party having to do with the populist movement. Um, so we've had a number of analysis that actually we've, we've published a couple in the PR by various people um, that suggest that this election cycle has been such a crisis for, these, for the main parties. Not only uh, that Bernie Sanders represented the potential for such a crisis, but that Donald Trump in breaking uh, the, the, uh, the Reagan coalition uh, represents a potential uh, shift in American politics that it could eventually open up a uh, room, some space for uh, development of an alternative party. Um, so I wondered if you had something to say to that. Um, and to Lenny, um, you brought up uh, the Republican Party when we did this panel four years ago, and you said the same thing, that we were on the verge of the complete collapse of, of American politics, um, that something was about to change. Um, in what ways has that analysis changed, or do you simply see the last four years as a, as a vindication of your analysis? And if so, um, could you tell us like what you expect to see coming forward, or yeah, maybe if you could exp uh, speak a little bit to more uh, more to that. Um, and Mimi, um, I'm concerned with um, the issue uh, how you would define um, leadership um, because you've like said that you, as a, a presidential candidate and as an organizer, that you do not provide a definite direction for people, that you do not provide even an education. Um, that, and I, what you have described is that when new people come along, um, you essentially hook them up with other organizers, that you give them a network. Um, and this is very much, I see how this is tied, to your analysis of the left as being in some way uh, unable to have over, to overcome socialism, uh, um, sectarianism. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak more to, you know, whether how you see uh, an education or leadership 
or an actual direction, because again, this is, would be uh, going back to the issue of the Populist Party. Populist Party seemed in many ways to be anti-capitalist, but it wasn't until the Socialist Party came along and organized itself in a very particular way um, that it gained a certain momentum and seemed to, at some point, threaten um, potentially uh, capitalism. Um, so I was wondering just if you could speak more on our historical juncture, where you see it go, us going forward, how you see that changing, um, how you see action developing into something that has a consciousness. Um, Should I answer first? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to sort of take a different view on the Civil War. I mean, I think, as Lincoln said, if we can save the Union, not freeing the slaves, we will. If we can you know, save the Union, freeing the slaves, we will. Uh, I mean, I think the slaves were freed by the slaves themselves, running away and joining the Union Army, by various maverick, radical Republican uh, commanders who gave land to the slaves when they occupied a plantation. And that forced the hand of Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln had this pact on the ground that he had hundreds of thousands of runaway slaves uh, with the Union Army. If you return them to the South, it makes the South stronger. What do you do with these people? They were called contraband. Uh, and he did the only logical thing he could. And that was for military necessity, issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Of course, it didn't apply to the border states that had been loyal to the <laughs> Union. Um, just like I was told by a, a, a German left-wing friend when I said, why did Merkel let all the refugees in? She, he said, she had a choice. You shoot them or you let them in. Uh, shooting them would be bad PR for Germany, given its history. Uh, and I think there was a little bit of that going on in the Civil War. So I'm just trying to say that sometimes we look not at all at the bottom up, like what the rank and file, what Joseph Wiedemeyer, Karl Marx's friend, did in St. Louis, and the German-American uh, socialists did in terms of fighting for the abolition of slavery. And we just think like the great man in Lincoln's cabinet uh, decided, okay, we've had slavery long enough. So I, I'm just trying to give a, a push for a um, sort of bottom up people's history a little bit. Now in terms of political parties, I want to say they're definitely, definitely in crisis. After all, the fact that Henry Wallace and Strom Thurmond are running, no, that's 1948. <laughs> okay, um, I, I take that back. I mean, so, we, we, you know, we, ha we have a real problem. It's 1964, and Barry Goldwater is totally splitting the Republican Party. Where are the Rockefeller Republicans going to go when, when the Goldwater fanatics booed their man at the convention? Uh, and on the other hand, you know, in 1968, the Democratic Party was toast. I mean, look at the McCarthy challenge. What I'm saying here is these political parties are unstable elements sort of like chemistry class or something. Like that. Uh, they're unstable elements. They're always going to go into crisis periodically. In fact, it's very rare that you have a presidential election where you couldn't make the argument that one or the other political parties uh, was in crisis. 68, you also had George Wallace running as an independent, you know, Southern, uh, Southern segregationist ticket. I mean, you often have them going in crisis. So I'm not saying that this isn't an important crisis, but I'm saying they're all important crises, right? And that it's a system based on crisis. Right? Just like 1929 uh, didn't mean the end of capitalism in the United States, the Great Recession uh, you know, meant the banks got bailed out and we didn't. I mean, you know, there have economic crises, there's, there's problems and crises within the, the political parties as well. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a constant. I mean, uh, the one thing I can predict is not when uh, the whole system come to a grind, because after all, Marx has successfully predicted, you know, 12 of the last three depressions, but the fact is that I can predict that political parties in the future will go into crisis. Yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, I, I completely agree with the analysis of the Civil War. You know, du Bois' chapter on black reconstruction called uh, what the slaves did, a general strike. And so I'm just saying that the political re realignment and the, his the economic forces were demanding that slavery be abolished, not that Lincoln did it or anything, but that the northern industrial sector of the ruling class had to defeat the slave power, and that it was they used the troops, uh, the slaves and the radical Republicans to transform society, and then they took it back. You know, that's that's what often happens. Um, so I I think that uh, in any case. Uh, Things have changed, you know, my, but my general analysis of the Civil War period and the political realignment 
stays the same, I think, because it's based on historical materialism and the economic forces that are transforming society. Now, obviously, I, uh, you know, in 2012, I was in the Justice Party, and I thought there was a real chance <coughs> of splitting the Democratic Party. I was very active in Progressive Democrats of America. I thought we could split Progressive Democrats of America. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I would go with Bill to these conventions and fight there. And obviously, uh, you know, conditions uh, weren't right. And I wouldn't have predicted that Bernie would do what he did, you know, so I'm not saying, uh, you know, I, I predicted this, but I think if you root yourself in historical materialism and the real forces in society, then you can understand what's happening and seeing it unfold. And I don't agree that this crisis is just like the other crises, you know. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, that, that's the, the benefit, I think, of rooting yourself in, in a real Marxist analysis. Um, you can tell what's going on in, in the early 60s and 64 with the, uh, the expansion. And you can also tell that beginning with the 73 recession, 74 recession, that something was changing. And if you look at things, the thing that's changing is the technology about the way things are being produced. That automation and computerization and robots are undermining the old industrial society, and that's the crisis. That's what's changing our entire society, just like Marx predicted, that when the way things are produced change, the entire society goes into an upheaval. And that you can see it in front of your eyes. Everybody, four years ago, they weren't even writing books about this. Now everybody's writing books about what percentage of the jobs are gonna be eliminated due to automation. Now artificial intelligence you know, you know is, is on the front burner. So we're seeing a radical transformation of society and the political realignment is almost secondary and incidental. Um, but as revolutionaries, we have to maneuver within the situation and, and fight. Uh, one of the things I, I, I believe is that um, the weakness of the, the left is such that um, uh, I'm not so sure that, uh, that we're going to come out in good shape in, in the coming years. And I think we have to prepare for that. That's why I was advocating rooting ourselves and sinking into the working class, because that's the only place where we can be protected. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the reality is if, if things continue going on and if this economic <coughs> crisis unfolds, um, we're going to be uh, pretty much up Shit's Creek. So uh, we have to take that into account as revolutionaries. Um, I, so I, I'm very concerned. I keep hoping that, uh, that capitalism will be a little bit more flexible than I think it is so we have a little bit more time. But what's going on now with the German banks is insane. You know, the, the Deutsche Bank, the, the value is dropping by a third. Commerce Bank is laying off 10,000 workers. The Italian banks are, are about <coughs> to collapse. The U.S. banking structure is exposed to, to France and Germany in a very serious way. And France and Germany is exposed to the Italian banks. There may be a very serious crisis. I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we have more time, but I really am uh, concerned that um, we're going to be in a very difficult situation. And it is really critical, especially for younger people who consider themselves revolutionaries, to begin getting serious. You know, it's very nice to hang out in the universities and debate shit, but, you know, <laughs> we need to begin to organize and sink ourselves into the working class that's what we did in the past, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, a lot of us went into the factories because that's where it was at, you know, and we, we tried to organize and do what we can. This time around, it, it, it's, uh, it's looking like it's pretty serious. And if you want to begin to have an impact on the future of this country, you know, we're not even talking about the environmental crisis, you know, I'm just talking about the immediate economic crisis, but the situation is very serious. And revolutionaries have got to come together and talk about how to move forward. You know, that's the key thing. Um, because otherwise, you know, we can fight the little fights and fight the good fight and, and end up, you know, nowhere. And uh, so 
Um, I think I'm a, a little bit more negative <laughs> four years on, uh, even though I'm a little more, more positive because of the upsurge in political activity, but we're still very weak, and the determining factor is consciousness. You know, is the consciousness of the revolutionaries and the consciousness of the working class, and it is up to us, you know, who have some kind of understanding, to uh, begin to implement our understanding. I just wanted to say something, uh, just really quick in response, and I, I don't know if this is any consolation or might give you any sense of optimism, but I heard you just mention, uh, um, you know, uh, getting out of the universities and, uh, you know. Uh, cut the shit with the, the debate in the universities. I can tell you that um, at, at least where I'm involved, uh, uh, there are a lot of folks out there that I know um, who don't even know that's going on, that their work is out in the streets, you know? And um, maybe they know that in the abstract that it's happening, mm -hmm. but they are involved out in the streets and to hear it, it's just like, I don't know what the hell's going on over there, you know? I, I don't know, maybe there's some reason for hope in there. Secondly, with regard to the question of leadership, uh, I remember about a year and a half ago, we had a freedom school in Los Angeles, and um, somebody from the floor brought up the question, uh, it seems like the Black Lives Matter movement in Los Angeles, there's no leader. And the facilitator said, that's right. And um, that, that resonated with me personally. Um, now, this doesn't mean to say that, you know, when with this campaign, that when we do our messaging, when we use uh, media, when we put together graphic design to deliver a message, that it's not drawing from an analysis. It's not drawing from a radical position, you know. Um, much of our platform comes from the Socialist Party USA's platform. That's a platform that was, uh, you know, developed collectively by members who show up to, um, you know, delegates who show up to a, a convention. So the messaging that's going out there, it is deliver, delivering a specifically and explicitly radical message, you know, and that there is a lot of strategic planning on the, the back end, uh, you know, with regard to how we might use the media, how we might use social media, how we might use art, graphic design, etc. And make no mistake, you know, when folks respond to that and say, hmm, I'm interested, we're not sending them to the Donald Trump campaign, you know. Um, we are sending them uh, and putting them in touch with other folks that we know personally because we've built those relationships um, who have a radical analysis in their communities, you know. Um, you know, trying to, or me personally, trying to pack a lot here into just a few sound bites, that can be, you know, somewhat difficult. Uh, there certainly is a lot of strategic planning on the backside, you know, and oftentimes the stuff that gets out there publicly is just, you know, that's sort of the punch, you know. So if there's a meme, um, if there's a video piece, etc., there was a lot of thought that goes into the kind of information that we're presenting publicly, uh, and that is information that is, like I said, it's explicitly radical. It comes from, you know, we happen to belong to a particular organization. Uh, it is, you know, we're trying to represent our organization, the delegates who voted for us, the best way that we can. We were explicit before we ran this campaign of how we were going to be doing this, giving folks the opportunity to vote up or down. And do we want these folks out there? Um, but, you know, once we received that nomination, we attacked and um, happy so far. <laughs> We have one more question. Yeah. And after this, uh, so with this last question, if we could roll that into the closing statements, since uh, we're just about out of time, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned the Bernie Sanders campaign a lot, and I think one of the things about that campaign that was so effective was its use of technology. And um, also, you're, you're saying, um, especially, you know, funny, I um, that, uh, you know, we got to appeal to something outside of just unions, and um, I guess my question is, um, then why, are, why is everything I see about third parties so opaque on the political science side and on the um, actual details side? Because I feel like people need a codex to understand that, and that's part of what, like, platypus is about, uh, but also, like, uh, you also pointed out to these these organizations that are really just fronts of the Democratic Party, and I know that, but I've been like politically active in Chicago for like eight years, so I'm just wondering, you know, we have publications that sort of point this out, but how, what, what sort of political education are you going to do, what sort of techniques are you going to appeal to to get this done? Because the high-level stuff is 
like doesn't appeal to me even because I'm like, do I really trust these people? And also, the autonomous group people, like a lot of, out of that movement, a lot of stuff has come to support things like Bernie and third parties. So I think your comment was really um, disrespectful, I think, to me and other people who are part of the autonomous movement. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not sure, I, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, I just think that there's a political discussion going on um, whether or not the fight for the political power is central or the, the, the fight to set up autonomous zones um, is the way to go. And I, 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 I don't know if that's what you're getting at. Say but, it that way, yeah. Oh, okay. Say it that way. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> my wife's always saying that. Um, uh, I just, uh, um, I think this, this question of political education is central and that there are different levels. One of the things we're doing in the, 35th, the United Neighbors of the 35th Ward, which is the ward organization in Carlos Rose's ward, um, is we have popular education sessions um, where we try to um, involve people in the neighborhood uh, with discussions for, you know, about different topics that directly affect them and the, you know, the political ramifications that uh, that, that means. So we, we are trying to do that. We're trying to figure out, you know, one of the questions I have and we're trying to grapple with is, is so often these, these educational sessions um, don't get at the content as much as we'd like and um, they're very wide-ranging discussions, so I think we're grappling with that and trying to develop an approach to, you know, how uh, we workers can educate ourselves, really. That's what that's all about. I, and I, the I, ironic thing is that we're having a similar problem in the Marxist education we do. That, um, you know, when, when workers get together and, and you know, we, we, we sit down to read the Communist Manifesto, and the discussion goes all over the place, you know? So, um, you know, I think, you know, that those are the key questions for revolutionaries today, is how to educate ourselves and how to um, educate uh, our neighbors. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's what you, that's what you were getting at, but um, uh, is, is that the questions you were raising about education, or um, am I missing? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think that um, uh, one of the things we're talking about is trying to figure out, um, now, with, now with the technology, you, you don't have to spend a lot of money printing newspapers and magazines. So I, I think we're, we're discussing uh, the need for some kind of online publications. Um, my personal opinion is that um, the video news source, therealnews.com, has been a very valuable uh, educational tool. I, I have problems with, with you know, some of the stuff they're putting forward, but I, I often use their discussions. I had an excellent discussion on the Momentum organization in England, which was uh, partially behind the Jeremy Corbyn election in the Labour Party, and I didn't even know that this organization existed in, in England. Um, and so they, they have a, a pretty good international uh, network of people, and so more and more we, you know, I think we can use uh, video news sources, films, and things like that. But we're really, um, in a lot of ways, like I was saying, the left is pretty weak, and we're just beginning to try. Some of us are just beginning to try and and uh, reinvent what we were doing, you know, uh, many years ago to, to today's conditions. Um, so. I don't know. I don't know if that's helpful. That's what we're trying to do with this. Go ahead, either one of you. I, th I think it was just. Well, no. Yeah, yeah closing remarks to fold into that. So, if you guys want to do some closing remarks. If you, oh, closing remarks. Yeah. Okay. I think. I think. 
so you don't have the takes time. Takes a second. It takes a second. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that the thing I'd just like to say very briefly, because I know we're almost out of time, is that essentially one of the problems I think we have is that people who want to educate have to educate themselves, because one of the things I find very frustrating is that not having looked at history, and I don't mean just a few names and dates, but I mean like how people organized, how they educate, how communities organize, um, you know, say anarchist uh, type movements in Spain, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we wind up making the same mistakes. And I think there's plenty of new mistakes we could make, but we shouldn't make the same mistakes we made in the past, such as relying on the Democratic Party and think that that's going to be our salvation. That would be an example of a mistake. Or thinking that uh, we can keep the same political structures, uh, which are completely undemocratic. I mean, look at the U.S. Senate, where every state gets two senators, even if nobody lives in it. Um, I think of Wyoming, full of horses and toxic waste dumps. But, you know, uh, obviously you have to change the laws, you have to change the structures. And, but you have to examine all these questions, you have to think about all these questions, and not look for a silver bullet or a magic charm, because, you know, it's going to be a, a complicated thing to work out in struggle. I mean, to work out in the process of doing these various things that people are, are trying to do. But, you know, make sure you don't sort of recreate, try to recreate the wheel and it turns out to be the same sort of flat tire we had in the past. Closing remark? Sure. Okay. So I often find myself as sort of being like um, an, an odd leftist in the fact that um, I, I'm actually happy with the comrades that I work with. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I personally look to them as a source of information and knowledge and um, and I sort of see um, on a daily basis, for me personally, that family expanding exponentially, you know? Um, and I see a willingness among folks uh, to share information, to share stories, to better connect with one another. Um, and I draw a lot from that. I mean, obviously this work is very hard, the community work is very hard, um, and it, it can feel relentless, it can be demoralizing at times. But um, seeing this expanding family of folks that are willing to, to engage with one another um, in ways that are, are, are very warm, um, it, it gives me a lot of fuel to continue fighting. Um, and like I said, some of the folks here are, are here in this room. And, uh, you know, there's something that folks have said, I think almost at each one of the campaigns we've had in person uh, so far, um, because we approach them as sort of these community discussions, a lot of information sharing, a lot of smiles, and yes, hugs, um, folks will often say, why can't this continue to happen? And why can't this happen everywhere? And I, I see no reason uh, why it can't and why it shouldn't, you know? Um, and maybe that sounds silly or whatever, but um, where folks go from there really has me excited, you know? Um, and I think that we can be explicitly radical. We can engage in the hard work of strategic planning. You know, we do our capacity assessments, our environmental scams, our logic models, all that sort of thing, because we want results, but also doing it in a way that treats one another with dignity and respect, that's very active and engaged, um, but it's also uh, very warm, supportive, and encouraging. Um, so, once again, I'd just like to wrap up by saying, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to be able to share this space with y'all, and um, I, I honestly look forward to working with y'all in the future. Um, if you're interested in, you know, this particular campaign, the campaign, uh, Saltistic Walker 2016 campaign, it is on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and that sort of thing, um, and, you know, I'm just down to work with y'all to kick the shit out of capitalism, so thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> round of, oh, oh, go ahead, sorry. All right, well, yeah, I said a lot of summer type of thing, but I, I think I want to <clears throat> reemphasize something that the last question uh, person brought up. I just think it's real important to talk to each other regardless of where we're coming from, you know, and and being, being an older person and steeped in some very rigid uh, uh, political orientation, sometimes that becomes difficult. Um, and I think that it's important for us to, to talk to each other regardless of what political traditions we come from because the transformations that are going on in society now have rendered all those old arguments, you know, obsolete, you know. 
and so uh, I, you know, I, I've stopped arguing between Stalinist and Trotskyist and, uh, and anarchist and this and that, and so, but sometimes it slips out again. But I, I think that it, it really, we can learn from each other, and these are really new conditions, and, and we have to figure it out. It's real important. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, uh, those challenges, you know, and, um, and that's why I'm here, you know. Uh, I, uh, over the years, I've developed some friends in, in Platypus, and, uh, you know, probably a while ago, I would never enter the room, but, <laughs> you know, here I am. So uh, I, I just want to encourage that discussion um, to continue. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs> thank you to the audience. Thank you to the audience. And thank you to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, we will be meeting for drinks uh, at, at the Billy Go Tavern off of... Uh, Lake, on Lake Street, just off of Wabash. Uh, anybody wants to come around? Uh, we also have, I want to mention that we have a reading group that meets Thursdays uh, at 6.30. You can sign up if you'd like uh, information on that. And we have coffee breaks. We're also involved in other, uh, in other, uh, on other campuses in Chicago and around the world. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Fun. Great thing. <laughs> I like that. Oh, man. It's hard being moderator, right? <laughs>